in our Bible and for this message tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And I've been through uh, through my many years, I don't keep keep too much of account where at and, ha and how many times I've been in 1 Thessalonians, the whole book, by the way, but I want to approach it kindly, and I, as in my memory is correct, I'm approaching it in a little different phase or an aspect with a message today. It won't go away. And so I kept praying in the night and uh, in the early hours in the morning trying to study. So uh, we're going to going to preach tonight, or rather this morning. I don't know where I'm getting at night. But we're going to talk about a model church this morning. The church at Thessalonica. In the earliest writings of the Apostle Paul, I must say, as he approached this church in a threefold way, and I was just kind of amazed even in chapter one in my studies, threefold truths along in this one chapter. But in a th three-way approach in Paul writing uh, this epistle to confirm young disciples in the foundational truths of the faith. And with the short period of time that Paul was at Thessalonica, it says that he taught them all the great foundational and fundamental truths of our Bible. And that must have been a lot going around, I'm telling you. Didn't leave anything. And I think if we could examine these five chapters along with Second Thessalonians, we'd find that Paul sure is setting forth all of the fundamental truths of the faith, amen, like the virgin birth and the deity of Christ, like the death of Christ, the resurrection, and of course the second coming of our Lord Jesus. And I'll not take the time to go over it, I've done that a lot, but in every chapter, whether it be First Thessalonians or Second Thessalonians, he deals, he comes up with a, with a note for the second coming, where it be the rapture coming or whether it be the revelation coming. And so he approaches this church to confirm young disciples in foundational truths that he had already taught them. And what makes this this these epistles of Thessalonica special, he he founded this church and he faithed them. He taught them the great fundamentals of the faith and he favored them because we're going to read about it in just a moment, how that he perpetually over and over was thanking God and praying for them and remembering them. Amen. And of course, he's going to talk to us about what he knew about the church at Thessalonica in our reading in the chapter that we read this morning, chapter one. So he's, uh, he's confirming young disciples in the foundational truths already taught them. And then he's exhorting them to go on to holiness. Amen. And I'm afraid that's a letdown in a lot of church circles and in, in, even around in this county, as much as I hear what little I hear through the Facebook of some other preaching. But anyway, I really believe that God's man ought to uh, exhort believers to Go on to holiness, holy living, living right, godly. And he, he taught this church that sanctification over him in chapter three and chapter four. And then he not only was confirming young disciples in the foundational truths already taught them and exhorting them to go on to holiness, but to comfort them concerning those who had fallen asleep. And many of them uh, were passing off the scene and their hearts were troubled and they was wondering, where's my loved ones at? And so Paul used uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, thank God to exhort that. Oh, thank God about the sleeping, those that have died in the Lord. And so we're gonna read to th this morning after I get started now with 1 Thessalonians chapter one, verse one through 10. And we're gonna talk about this word model. It means a pattern or design or a representation of. 
and so real, the real church. I'm telling you, of course, he's addressing the local New Testament Bible-believing church at Thessalonica. That's what we are in this house, member believers in Christ for the most part of any local church that's true to the Bible. But anyway, the true church that the Lord purchased with his own blood. But I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna read some and I'll try to bring this message the Lord's laid upon my heart. Father, we thank you for the great privilege, Lord, that you give us on another Lord's Day morning, this side of the second coming of our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you uh, uh, have been already with us in this service. Lord, I, I can sure feel your presence in this place and I pray you'll bless now as we read and bring this message. Lord, you might sanctify and seal it and saturate our hearts with your word and do a good work that only you can do, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now reading about this model church and Paul begins in his salutation and his greeting. And he said, Paul and Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timotheus, that's Timothy. And it said unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father, and in our Lord, and, and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you. And so Paul starts out in this chapter, he does not address it as an apostle, he does not address it as a prisoner. He does as he does in many of the other epistles. And he does not address it as a servant, but he addresses it with his two, two fellow laborers, Timothy and Silas, and unto the church of the Thessalonians. And he said, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right off we see see the church, amen. And we're gonna talk about three things, if I can just get it over this morning, th three points. Well, you say, well, that's gonna be short, but don't leave out the sub points that I might use. But anyway, this church, the worth and the work and the weight of the church, amen. And so the worth, the elective, their elective standing, they were in God the Father and in God the Son. I heard a fellow pastor of a church here in this county just recently, and he said, we're in Christ. And I thought, well, you're learning. You're do He's a young pastor, and I thought, you're learning. But that didn't stop. He said, but we got to remain in Christ. And I thought, well, hog we're showing that. We don't got to remain in Christ. God shows us in Christ. He done that before the foundation of the world. And we ain't got to do a thing after we're saved and put in Christ by the one Holy Spirit. We ain't got to do anything to remain in Christ. We're in him continually and perpetually and, and forever. Amen. But here was this, uh, this church. It's worth. And that's what I, I'm directing, the, not the worth of you and I. Uh, in the flesh, but the worth of the church, what makes it, uh, it, it its identity stand out, the representation of the church, its identity, its worth, its elective standing in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ and with the greeting, grace be unto you, amen. And surely that's grace and it sure has reached down where we couldn't reach up and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so in his greeting, he said, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And can't have any peace without grace, amen. And then he, he gives thanks now. I've told you uh, he favored this church. He founded it and he faithed it. And of course, he's faithfully pinning down these words to the church, amen, and, and given in the sight of God what this church, the, its identity, amen. But he said, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayer. And so we can right off say that Paul 
sure had them in his heart. He prayed for them. And he sure had had, had some some way uh, and, and a perpetual way uh, attitude of gratitude, thanking God for them. Maybe some of them didn't sit well with him as it does in, in some church circles. But anyway, he still prayed for them and thanked God for them. Amen. And here he said, remember. Now we're approaching verse number three here. As I've said now, he's... Uh, he, he's, he's exhorting them to go on to holiness and confirming those that, that had, uh, had already taught the word of God. And so here's a threefold ca characteristic of this church. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. And so their evidence of true faith is right here identified, amen. They had a work of faith, they had a labor of love, and they had a patience of hope. The life which they possessed manifested itself in a work of faith and in a labor of love and in a patience of hope. And that'll be more real when I read on down. And then we see not only their elective standing in verse one and their evidence of true faith, but we see their election in verse four. And Paul ain't going out on a limb with election like Calvinism and hyper-Calvinism. He's just saying God doing the choosing. God's done the calling. And we know that we've had to call. Amen. Having to do whether it be of salvation or service. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. He knew something about the church, amen. And I believe it's the pastor's responsibility to every individual believer, every individual one that makes up the church, have some kind of knowledge and understanding about one another in a spiritual matter, amen. And then notice we see their effectiveness, amen, at the gospel for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and much assured as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And so the effectiveness of, of the gospel, amen. Oh, how important that is that we we continually, and I try to try to make that a a matter of importance and and try to try to do it on a on a perpetual manner to bring up the gospel, the be, being the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, the good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And so the effectiveness, he said this gospel, it came to you not only in word, but also in the Holy Ghost. And that's where our salvation comes in. <coughs> and y'all doing the a calling and electing and you and I doing the receiving of the gospel. And the Holy Ghost works to do that, to put that gospel in our heart and bring conviction and, and bring a seed, an incorruptible seed that we're born again with. And so we're seeing the effectiveness as we identify the church at Thessalonica. And then notice, we notice in verse six now, and we see their example, amen. And ye became followers of us, Paul said, and all the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, amen. And thank God Paul had an influence on these believers at Thessalonica. He was so close to them, had them in his heart and in his prayers and his praise, remembering and knowing all about them. But he said, you're, you become followers. You become imitators of us. And as we follow the Lord, following the Lord Jesus, and having received the word, he said, in much affliction, with joy 
of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And that's one thing that has stuck with me through my years after I really got saved by God's grace. And I tell you, before that, I had religion as, as religious as an old no hog and lost and going to hell and, and trying from one service to another. And a lot of times, I tried trying to do better and couldn't do no better. But thank God when the Holy Ghost moved in, put joy in my heart, give me a peace with God. And of course, as I follow the Lord of peace, uh, uh, the peace of God that passes all understanding, but oh, thank God for that joy. Joy over the blessed word of God. That Holy Ghost makes all the difference. And then we see, no, no, he said there, the examples, he said, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Amen. Oh, thank God that the people around where these believers live, they saw something real, real Christianity in shoe leather, I might say. And then we see their evangelism. Amen. In verse 8, and from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. And so evangelism, a soul winning church, a saved church, a spirit filled church, amen. And so on and on we can go with these verses as we see the identity, this church in representation as we see the worth and the work of the church. And now notice as we look down at verse number nine, and I don't want to miss this verse nine. And here we're seeing, thank God, uh, the three phases of, of this church uh, in real Christianity. And it said, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turn to God from idols. And so Paul's bringing up, he's bringing a remembrance. He knows about these people uh, that he had helped win to the saving knowledge of the Lord. He, he knew where they used to be serving he, in, in heathen darkness and idolatry. And, and of course, they sure need to get saved. And of course, this Bible said how they turn to God. Eh? And that's old time repentance. I'm telling you, that's sure lacking in pre being preached in our land and country. But Paul, through the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter, 20. He said we preach repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And simply repentance is having a change of mind that leads to a change of heart. Being sorry for what you are. A lot of folk last night drunk themselves to I, I tell you, into a stupor and I couldn't find themselves if they had to. Had to get home maybe. But anyway, got up this morning sorry for what they'd do, uh, not sorry for what they are, but all time remit penance, thank God, man taking his place before a holy God that is unsaved and needs Christ. And that's what these believers at Thessalonica, they had turned to God. That was their work of faith, amen. And it said from their idols and then second of all, as saved to serve the living and true God. And I'm afraid in this religious day, they take them into the church and they baptize them in the pool and hey, they confirm them and, and go, they do them little children, they sprinkle them. And, and of course, that's all they probably ever know, most of them in religious circles in our day. But I'm reminding you, if you really get saved God's way, God will put a burden in your heart. God will put a compassion in your heart. God will put a concern. God, I'll tell you, he, his constraint, the love of Christ constraineth us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge if one died for all, then all were dead. And so here they not only had turned to God, that was their salvation, that was their work of faith, but oh, thank God, we see 
here as I read from verse 3, their labor of love. Amen. From a heart that labors, I tell you, I said that the life which they possessed manifested itself in three ways. The work of faith, they turned to God from idol, but their labor of love. All oh, it said to serve the living and true God. And the church I used to pastor in Clinton, they had this big old sign. Uh, it's a pretty good long driveway up to the church from the main street. And it had this big old sign. And, and it said going in to, to worship. And when on the other side, when you left, it said leaving out to serve. Amen. And that's a good way of putting it. God saved us and put put in our heart to, to live for him and serve him with all the compassion we, could, we, we should have. Amen. And so their labor of love, they were serving the living and true God. We don't come in here to serve. We come in here to worship. But when we go out to them door, there's a world out there that's lost and, and going to hell. the biggest part of the uh, the world. I tell you, in a, in a lot of in, in a lot of uh, uh, looking at it in the realms of Christy uh, uh, in Christian dome, we call it both the true and the false. You've got uh, those that just uh, merely have a profession. Oh, they're trying to serve God and don't don't have a heart to serve. But here's the church, its identity, their labor of love, and in them, their patience of hope. Amen. Their patience of hope. And it said in verse 10, and here it is, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And so we've looked over it just a little bit, and I'm, I'm just going to go a little bit further before I stop the message this morning, but we see a model church, amen, all represented in three phases with their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. And when we come to the second chapter, we see a model servant and his reward. And here's the church now. Paul knew about them in chapter one, a model, model church represented in three phases. But chapter two is what Paul knew about, uh, what they knew about Paul, amen, and surely he was a servant of the Lord. I'm telling you, bought by blood, had bound by love, and Paul had give his life. I'm you, as much as he had give himself, I tell you, to work havoc and, and, and kill Christians before he got saved, I'm telling you, he sure give it all. I, I tell you, to have it against the church, but oh, when he got saved on the road to Damascus, got born again, amen. And the Bible said in Acts 9 that immediately, amen, and he went preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, and of course, them Jews would lay in wait to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him, but because uh, the message he preached didn't set with a religious crowd. It don't set with a religious crowd this day. But oh, thank God, Paul was zealous and, and oh, he sure, he sure did have a compassion for his own people, the Jew. Oh, yes, thank God. He could wish himself a curse from Christ for his brethren according to the flesh, Romans chapter 9 and Romans 10, he said, my heart desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Amen. And so when we look at chapter 2, we're looking at a model servant. Not only is a model church in chapter 1, a model servant. Thank God in his reward. Amen. Paul knew, thank God, that one day there'd be a day at the coming of our Lord Jesus. Well, he'd get to be able to see those he had preached to and was uh, influential and able to lead to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus, and that'd be his reward. That's 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, when he said, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? And he said, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? 
for ye are our glory and joy. And so Paul was looking ahead at the rewarding day. Thank God every child of God or, or have that in view on this day. In Second John, John said, look in verse eight, look to yourselves that you lose not those things which you have wrought, but that you receive a full reward. So chapter two deals with the model servant, amen, and his reward. And then chapter three now deals with the model saint, amen, in the role of sanctification, amen. Oh, look at this, look at these verses that I just picked out. I don't read here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And he said in verse 11, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And that the Lord may, that, that, and then the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, you may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And oh, if I know chapter three, and of course on into chapter four, he's dealing with a model saint, amen. A saint in representation, a real saint of God. I tell you, this has been set apart and made holy, amen. A holy position and in a practical sense, practical sanctification, which he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number four and verse number three, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, honor, not in the lust of compensation, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And so Paul is in uh, speaking about a model saint in chapter three and on into chapter four, the model saint in the role of sanctification. Amen. Oh, John 17, 17, our Lord prayed for us. Amen. And we were already uh, to saved, sanctified when we were saved. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, and verse number 14, it says he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. He sanctified us when he saved us. But on a practical sense, we are being sanctified. And of course, on a, on a future note, at the appearing of Christ, we will be sanctified. And he taught that church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you whole. And that's holy. And that's perfect sanctification that will take place at the appearing of our Lord Jesus. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've seen the model church in chapter one, the model servant in chapter two, and the model saint in chapter three. But in looking on now in chapter number four, we see the model believer, amen, and his uh, revealed hope. Amen. And I'm glad that God's children have hope. Amen. Oh, you better believe it. Thank God. And we're going to talk about it on the next lesson, whether it be, with, and I'm, I'm kind of just uh, uh, praying as I preach this morning. You say, can you do that? Well, I try to, trying to pray about having services tonight, but if we don't, We'll, we'll, we'll continue this message and I want to talk about a scriptural view of the word waiting on the next part of our lessons, the Lord willing. But in that word wait, that means to stay or to remain. And that means, thank God, that every child of God 
ought to have a expectancy. Amen. And oh, thank God, our hope. Amen. The church, I'm telling you, have has a hope. Amen. The blessed hope of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he deals with that in chapter 4. The rapture coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the final chapter in 1 Thessalonians, he deals with the model walk. And he does that in response to the day of the Lord. He ends up chapter 5 with 20 two commands. Amen. I say on this day, if we really are waiting for Jesus, if we're looking up and, and longing for him to come, even on this day, it'll make a difference in how we live and how we look. And, 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 and I'm telling you, the Lord wants us to know there are some things we ought to be doing. And I'm not talking about doing something to be saved or to stay saved, but I'm saying as saved, there are some things we can do while we wait. And that's another message in it. So the model walk in chapter number five in response to the day of the Lord. And notice now, as I try to wind this message up just a little bit, as we talk about this church at Thessalonica. And I, I, I mentioned in verse number 10, amen, their patience of hope. And I read this verse 10 again. And Paul had taught them, he had taught them to wait for the second coming of our, the rapture coming, amen. And of course, Second Thessalonians, when, when, when you look at Second Thessalonians chapter two, in his occasion to write that second epistle, uh, because they had, 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 had sent a document or wrote a letter and signed, signed Paul's name he didn't have nothing to do with and said that they were already in the tribulation because they were going through persecutions and tribulation. And so Paul wanted to clear that up about the day of the Lord, what's going to take place. And so we're seeing here, he taught them to wait for his son in verse 10 from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. And I went over this kindly in reading and going along and just passing it by so, sort of in the, uh, already in the lesson today. But the identity of this church in three aspects, in, in the, the identity of worth, in the identity of work, and in the identity of weight. And now let's just recap this a little bit and we'll go home. In the in the identity of their worth, amen. And I'm not talking about you and I being worthy of anything as to the flesh. No, I'm talking about our worthy calling in Christ. We're, we're a child of God. We're saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when God saved us, he took all of our bragging rights away from us, amen. And when we step off on glory side, I'm telling you, and w without an end for a million and millions of years and in a world that'll be no end, I'm telling you, we're not going to be strutting around and saying, look what all I've done to get here. No, I tell you, we're going to be praising the Lamb that has redeemed us by His blood out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And so the worth of the church, amen. I tell you, the Lord takes a lot, makes a lot of emphasis upon the true church, amen. In Ephesians 5, 25, he said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. In love, he purchased it. And then the next verse says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of the water by the word. And in, in a present tense, he in love, he's, he's sanctifying the church. He's purifying it. Amen. And then the next verse, and I'm turning over to read this. Right, we're right at it. In Ephesians 5 and verse number 27. And this blessed King James Bible said that he might present it to himself 
a glorious church, amen. That's what the Lord thinks of the church he purchased with his own blood. That's what he thinks about the church he's now purifying and cleansing, amen. Or that he might, in a future tense, thank God that he might present it. And it'll be on a day of presentation. Jude verse 25 said, uh, now that he now he's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, it'll not be the Lord turning some away when we get to our no, absolutely not. We've already, thank God, we're already headed for heaven if we're already there. Thank God we're saved by God's grace. But, but there will be a day of presentation. Somebody said they believed that Paul would present the church to Christ. Somebody said the Holy Spirit will present it. I really don't. I can't really say. I really cannot say enough with a scripture to say that. But I do know that this Bible said that he might present it to himself. Amen. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And that's what the Lord thinks of the, the worth of the church. Amen. A saved church here existing in the time of Paul that founded this church. He established, he established them in the fundamentals of the, not everybody in church circles can say that. Oh no, I tell you, you go into churches and they're dumber, dumber than a box of rocks if I might say it. And that, that's to their ignorance and I'm I'm not being being beaten up on somebody, but some people ain't never got a stand. They've been in church 40 years and ain't never got established and settled in the Word. I like to preach to people like I did Tuesday night. Amen. Thank God will sanction that. Know what you're preaching about. Amen. And here was a serving church, serving the true and living God. Here was a soul winning church. They sounded out the Word of God. And of course, here was a suffering church. Make no doubt about it. If you stand for God and right and stand for this King James Bible and stand with God's man, you're going to have persecution. You're going to be, you're going to suffer. Amen. And then we see it was a separated church. Amen. Oh, I'm, that's where we get that sect of it. He called on them to go on unto holiness. I do preach holy living. Amen. Look at second, and I'm almost done now. Second Corinthians chapter seven and verse one. As he ended up talking about this uh, doctrine of separation in chapter six. But in chapter seven, verse one, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us. And Paul's got himself included. Paul didn't claim himself to be be uh, somebody uh, a sinless perfection. He was like us all. He still wrestled with the flesh. Uh, he said in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body of death. But he said, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so we're talking about the worth of this church, a separated church, and it was a secure church. Amen. Thank God had that hope, amen, that the Lord would come. Thank God. In the pre-tribulation, in the preeminence of the Lord, thank God at any time, amen, the imminent appearing of our Lord. And Paul had taught them how to look for that blessed hope. And I, I really favor that Paul looked for the Lord in his day because he said it well in Philippians 1 and verse 23. He said, I'm in a street between two. He said, I, I, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. And he knew it was more better for him to stay here and, and, and preach the gospel and do what he did as a, as a soldier of the cross. And all oh, he said, my desire is that I depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. And so we've kindly looked 
at the worth of the church. Amen. It's elective standing in God the Father and in God the Son and in God the Holy Spirit. You couldn't be lost if you tried to because we're in the Father and we're in His hand and we're in the Son. And He said, My Father which gave them me is greater than all and no man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Paraphrasing that a little bit and of course to cap it all we're in the spirit amen the spirit of God has put his seal has put his mark upon us ain't no devil no hounds of hell I tell you there ain't nobody can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ and of course the work amen all the identity of this the work amen oh thank God that work of faith amen I'm, I say again that the third time the life which they possess manifested itself in those three things their work of faith their labor of love and their patience of hope and then the church, amen. It's identity in waiting, amen. They're we waiting on Jesus, whom God had raised from the dead, who had saved them from the wrath to come, amen. And all oh, just think about it on this Lord's day. Here we occupy the pews of this church, but before nightfall, I'm telling you, we could be with the Lord, amen. And we're gonna get a getting out of here. Eh? If I use it in Southern slang, we're gonna get an exit out of here and an entrance into glory. We're gonna escape the awful wrath that's coming on this old wicked world. All to be saved. I'm telling you, saved from the wrath to come. First Thessalonians 5, in closing verse 9, for we are, have, he has appointed us unto sin, for we have not been appointed unto wrath, but to obtain a salvation that's delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ. And old timers used to sing that song. I don't know what the name of it was, but part of it said, our deliverance will come and it could come on this day. We're, the church is waiting, amen. Well, that's what 